Welcome back, everyone. I'm Jordan Giesegi, and this is The Limiting Factor. At Tesla's 2023 annual meeting, Elon Musk said that lithium refining is the bottleneck for lithium-ion battery production, and he doesn't expect there to be a bottleneck with lithium mining. In other words, he disagrees with lithium industry experts, which are all saying that mining will be the bottleneck. But he also said that he could be wrong. So is Elon wrong, or is the lithium industry wrong? Answering that question actually requires a full walkthrough of the global lithium supply chain, and so this video is an excerpt from a larger video that covers the topic in full. The full video is already available for Patreon supporters, Twitter subscribers, and YouTube members. I'll be releasing one section of the video every two weeks before releasing the full video at the end of the series. In this video, we'll explore Elon's statement from Investor Day that there's enough lithium in the ground to transition the world to sustainable energy. Then, we'll look at forecasts for global lithium supply that show that despite there being enough lithium in the ground, the supply of mined lithium isn't expected to keep up with demand. That obviously raises the question of whether lithium forecasts are accurate, so we'll look at the assumptions that go into lithium forecasts. From there, I'll put forward a provisional bear and bull case for lithium supply that we'll build on in the upcoming videos. Before we begin, a raft of credits and thanks are in order. Feel free to skip this part of the video and move to the next timestamp if you watch the previous video. I'm including the thanks and credits on each video in the series for the people who haven't seen the other videos. That's because it's not just a thanks, it lets viewers know the quality of my sources and peer review. First, Vivas Kumar reviewed the draft script. Vivas was directly involved with Tesla's battery supply chain for nearly three years, where he negotiated billions of dollars of materials spend and also did strategic analysis and forecasting for battery materials. After that, he worked for Benchmark Mineral Intelligence for nearly three years. He's now co-founder and CEO of Metrichem. If you'd like to know more about that, check out my interview with Vivas and Chiru. Next, my sources. Rodney and Howard of RK Equity, a lithium analysis and advisory firm, spent several hours and long email threads answering detailed questions about mine development. If you're interested in their work, you can connect with them on Twitter with the details on screen or follow the Rockstock channel on YouTube. Cameron Perks of Benchmark Mineral Intelligence walked me through how lithium supply and demand is evolving over time. I recommend following Benchmark Mineral Intelligence and their CEO Simon Moores on Twitter to keep up to date with the lithium industry. Lars Liesdahl provided key data for this video around lithium refining capacity versus production. And beyond that, I've used a number of graphs from Rystad Energy over the years. You can also follow Lars on Twitter. Austin Devaney helped me put a finer point on a few topics around hard rock lithium mining. Austin was an executive at Albemarle and Rockwood Lithium for nearly 10 years, which is one of Tesla's largest lithium suppliers, and now has been at Piedmont Lithium for the past three years, which has an agreement for future supply to Tesla. Bradford Ferguson and Matt Smith of Rebellionaire.com reviewed the final release candidate of the video from an investor lens. Rebellionaire specializes in helping investors manage concentrated positions. They can help with covered calls, risk management, and creating a financial master plan from your first principles. Bear in mind, this video is not investment advice, and always do your own research. Finally, despite all the input I received from some of the leading experts and information sources in the lithium industry, all the opinions in this video are my own. There are differing views and forecasts within the lithium industry that I had to reconcile and combine with my own insights and expectations. With regards to the peer review, it was for factual accuracy and a sanity check rather than for crafting the tone and conclusions of the video. Overall, my goal was to create the most comprehensive resource out there on how global lithium supply and battery supply will evolve this decade and how that relates to Tesla. So if you feel like I've hit the mark and get value from the video or my content in general, toss a coin to your witcher. Making a video like this takes months, and generally, analysis like this would be packaged up by an analyst house and put in a report that costs thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. Generally, I make about two to $600 per video in YouTube ad revenues. That is, it's the direct support that I get from less than 1% of subscribers through Patreon, YouTube, and Twitter that makes the channel possible. 
The details for support are in the description. Let's get into it. First, it's worth reviewing Tesla's claim from Investor Day that there's enough lithium in the ground to transition the world to sustainable energy. For those who watched the Investor Day presentation, this will be a brief recap, but I'll be adding some context and specific numbers to put some meat on the bones of Tesla's claim. The image on screen indicates that it'll take less than 30% of the world's lithium resources to transition the world to sustainable energy. However, a resource is an estimate of how much of an element might be in the ground. That is, the work hasn't been done to define how much of the element is actually there, and whether it can be extracted profitably. For example, the ocean contains enormous amounts of lithium, but it's at such low concentration that currently it can't be extracted profitably. That's where this graph on lithium reserves comes in. Reserves are resources that are well defined. We know how much material they contain and generally whether the material can be extracted profitably. I say generally because profitability depends on both market price, which fluctuates, and extraction efficiency, which improves over time as technology improves. Although Tesla's graph on reserves is illustrative, it's normalized to the year 2000, meaning that it doesn't tell us how much material is in the ground, but rather how much reserves have grown over the past two decades. Is the eight times growth in lithium reserves enough to transition the world to sustainable energy? Let's look at U.S. Geological Survey data for global lithium production and reserves. As of 2022, global lithium reserves were nearly 25 million tons of elemental lithium. That's enough for roughly 178 terawatt hours of batteries. I'd like to emphasize that's a back of the napkin estimate, and it could be off by plus or minus 25% depending on what type of battery cell is used. In Tesla's Master Plan Part 3, they call for about 198 terawatt hours of battery cells, so the reserves come up a bit short. However, lithium reserves have grown by about 80% in the past five years, and I have no doubt that within the next three to five years, even taking into account that some of those reserves may be off limits due to political challenges, we'll have all the lithium reserves we need to transition the world to sustainable energy. So if most of the work is done to find and define lithium reserves, why do lithium forecasts show that lithium supply will come up increasingly short as the decade progresses? If all that's needed here is mining, and mining is just digging things up, what's the issue? In short, mining is a lot more complicated than just digging things up. And, just like it'll take Tesla years to build enough factories to hit their goal of 20 million vehicles per year, it's going to take years to build the mines to supply those factories. However, the mines have to jump through more regulatory and technical hoops before they can even break ground. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. To fully understand why mining will likely be the bottleneck for lithium production, we first need to look at forecasts for lithium supply and demand. That's for three reasons. First, lithium supply tends to be the focus of most discussions I've seen about lithium. But despite being half the equation, lithium demand is often neglected. Second, we need to understand the assumptions behind the forecasts and what makes a good forecast. Along the way, we'll get a feel for some high and low end boundaries for lithium supply and demand. Third, that in turn is a good springboard to take a detailed look at where all the units of supply and demand will come from and why, and therefore where the forecasts could be wrong. From there, we can build our own forecast. With that in mind, let's start by looking at three forecasts from low to high quality. This graph from Liontown Resources is based on data from Wood Mackenzie. The first thing I'd note about the graph is that it contains the wrong units. It should be in megatons rather than kilotons. That would be an easy mistake for most people to make, but it's a big mistake if you work in the industry. The next thing worth noting is that, in my opinion, the demand is below what's reasonable. They project 1.9 million tons of LCE demand by 2030. LCE stands for Lithium Carbonate Equivalent, which just tells you that they weren't referring to pure lithium, but rather a commonly traded lithium chemical. Five LCE units are equivalent to about one unit of pure lithium, because lithium carbonate is about 80% carbonate by weight. However, 1.9 million tons LCE is fairly abstract. What does that mean in terms of battery production? 
it's roughly 2.7 terawatt hours. For perspective, this year in 2023, there will likely be over 1 terawatt hour of actual lithium demand. That means the graph is forecasting an average annual growth rate of only 15%. That's as compared to the actual average demand growth for lithium over the past six years, which was 40% per year. Furthermore, Tesla stated that just from their demand alone, they're targeting 3 terawatt hours by 2030. That is, Tesla expects their own in-house usage to be more than Wood Mackenzie is forecasting for the entire world. This graph from Lithium Americas, which is based on data from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence from 2021, is a little better in a few ways. First, the LCE units are at the correct magnitude, megatons. Second, the 2030 demand forecast is for 2.4 megatons, which is enough for about 3.4 terawatt hours of battery cells. That's getting a bit more realistic, but in my view, it's still too low and doesn't specify whether that's a bull, bear, or base case. Third, the supply data actually includes a rough split between increases in supply from mines that are already operating, brownfields mining projects, and greenfields mining projects that are probable or highly probable. Brownfields projects are expansions near existing mines that have already been surveyed, and Greenfields projects are completely new mines. Overall, it appears that Lithium Americas used a simplified version of Benchmark Minerals data to good effect. However, let's look at a more up-to-date forecast directly from Benchmark Minerals that provides a greater level of detail. First, the 2030 demand forecast shows two primary pathways, a base case at 2.9 megatons LCE and a high case at 5.4 megatons LCE, which equate to roughly 4 terawatt hours and 7.6 terawatt hours. Could the demand in 2030 be up to 7.6 terawatt hours? Absolutely. 7.6 terawatt hours would be an average growth rate of 34% per year, which is less than the average growth rate over the last six years, so it's fairly reasonable. Furthermore, it's not just reasonable historically, but also backed up by the 8.5 terawatt hours of gigafactory capacity that's already been announced for 2030. 7.6 terawatt hours of demand from 8.5 terawatt hours of capacity would mean a fairly high utilization rate for those factories of 89%. That is, it doesn't accommodate much for things like downtime, yield loss, and production ramps. With that said, more gigafactories are being announced each year. Last year, rather than 8.5 terawatt hours of gigafactory announcements, there was only about 6.7 terawatt hours. That is, the desire and or need is there for a huge amount of battery cells later this decade, and it's growing every year. The question is, will there be enough lithium, other materials, capital, and talent to get those factories off the ground? More on that later in the video. Next, let's look at supply. Benchmark tracks every lithium mine in the world along with the plans of each mine, and then they assign a probability on the likelihood that each mine will go into production for a given year. There are seven categories of supply. Operating supply is production supply expansions at mines that are currently operating. Secondary supply is actually recycled material, which is often neglected in supply forecasts. Karen maintenance supply results from improvements to existing supply sources, and so it's so minimal that it doesn't really show on the graph. Brownfield supply expansion, which I mentioned briefly earlier, is expansion near existing mines. Beyond that, there's highly probable, probable, and possible expansions in supply from Greenfield's mining projects, which are new mines. Now that we have a basic understanding of the two primary demand scenarios and the basic elements that make up supply, let's look at how the data is evolving over time. For the dashed gray line, I asked Cameron Perks at Benchmark to overlay their demand forecast from three years ago to get a feel for how the landscape has shifted over time. As you can see, the base case demand scenario has shifted upwards, and if my thinking is correct and demand is close to the high case demand scenario, the demand curve is starting to look more like an S-curve. And that's exactly what we should expect from the key component of a new technology like EVs, the same adoption curve that many other technologies have followed. The question is, will this adoption curve be hampered by the supply of raw materials? More on that later. So if Benchmark's demand line has shifted upwards, has their supply forecast also shifted upwards? Yes. 
This graph from about three years ago shows that supply and demand are roughly aligned until about 2027, and then demand breaks away from supply around 2028 when supply is at around 1.4 megatons. The new graph with up-to-date data also shows supply and demand roughly aligned until about 2027, and demand also breaks away from supply around 2028, but it happens when demand is at about 2.2 megatons rather than 1.4 megatons. That is, the shapes of the graphs are nearly identical, but over the past three years, supply and demand have drifted upwards by over 50%, which is a pretty huge variance. What's going on here? Why did the lithium forecast change so much between 2020 and 2023? In my view, there's three primary factors. Let's take a look. First, as I'll explain later in the video, between 2018 and 2020 there was a demand crash for lithium, which caused surplus lithium supply to the point where some lithium miners idled some of their production capacity. When demand started returning in 2021, it was just a matter of cranking the dial to increase supply. That is, Benchmark Minerals' 2020 supply forecast was hiding latent supply due to weak demand. Supply usually doesn't exceed demand because selling when demand is weak can mean selling at break-even or at a loss. That in turn means supply and demand tend to move in unison and only diverge when lithium supply comes up short, rather than vice versa. The second factor that caused Benchmark Minerals' forecast to be revised upwards is that the high lithium prices of the past two years have driven the development of new mining projects. As we'll see, a lot of that new supply contains fish hooks and includes caveats, but the market is responding. What all this means is that circumstances have changed for both supply and demand and the forecasts have had to adapt. The third factor that caused Benchmark Minerals' forecast to be revised upwards was the forecasting methodology itself. As I said earlier, Benchmark Minerals tracks every lithium mine in the world along with the plans of each mine as well as Gigafactory announcements. Their dataset is robust. However, they don't build factors into their forecast that can't be predicted, like the effect of high prices on supply growth, how many new gigafactories will be announced, or the impact of rapidly emerging supply in regions like China and Africa that have shorter lead times. That means that so long as we're in a supply-constrained environment, both supply and demand forecasts for lithium are likely to continue to undershoot actual supply and demand. If that's the case, what's the point of forecasts for lithium supply and demand? If you're a player in the lithium industry, it tells you what the future looks like based on all the information currently available. That is, it's a benchmark. It's a starting point for understanding an analysis, not the end game. For example, the forecasting data can be combined with pricing data and cost of production data to develop growth, production, and pricing strategies. What if you're a Tesla investor? We can use the forecast to frame up high and low end boundaries for lithium supply and then take a closer look at potential lithium supply from all sources to see where actual lithium supply might fall within that range. From there, we can factor in Tesla's plans and see where Tesla's plans start colliding with potential supply issues. For the low end boundary, I've set global lithium supply in 2030 at 3.5 terawatt hours, which is the current upper lithium supply target for benchmark minerals. I'm setting that as the bear case number because lithium supply forecasts have been creeping upward as lithium supply responds to demand. If the 3.5 terawatt hour bear case came to pass, it would make life difficult for Tesla because their 3 terawatt hour target for battery consumption in 2030 would be about 86% of the global market, which isn't realistic. For the high-end boundary, I've set global lithium supply in 2030 at 7.6 terawatt hours, which is Benchmark Minerals' high demand case forecast. I'm setting that as the bull case number because it's higher than any bull case I've seen, but still a reasonable 34% average annual growth rate. If the bull case came to pass, Tesla's 3 terawatt hour target for battery consumption would be about 39% of the market, which would make Tesla's life a lot easier. In the next video, we'll do a deep dive into every potential major source of mined lithium for the rest of the decade, how each source could affect the lithium supply, and therefore get a better feel for where lithium supply could fall within the bull-to-bear range. That's all for today, but before I close out the video, as I said at the beginning of the video, if you can, toss a coin to your witcher. The information I've provided today is, to my knowledge, the most comprehensive video on lithium supply out there. 
Other reports that are available on the market can cost thousands of dollars, and by comparison, if this video does well, I expect it to make less than $1,000 from YouTube ad revenues. It's the supporters who contribute directly that make the channel possible. On that note, a special thanks to Lucius, George Giese, Jeff Raymer, Jim Higgins, and Bill for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, Twitter subscribers, and all the patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for tuning in.